Well, hello, all you fabulous folk out there in fan land. We are elated to see you yet again for another stirring installment of Disinformed Fan Friction. I'm Shane. I'm Michael. And I'm Steven. And thank you for joining us, as always, on another Wacky Wednesday, and we appreciate you being here. In case you're unfamiliar, we are at least two-thirds of the four hosts of the Disinformed podcast, which flees your preferred provider app every single marvelous Monday. And of course, if you dig what you hear here, Michael's got some instructions for you. Smash the like button, ring that bell, leave a like and a comment, uh, hit subscribe. I, I said hit like twice, but sure do did. it twice. No, wait, if they hit if it you twice, do it twice, it removes it. Yep. Again, do hit that. the like button. If Just you did it, it every times, three times, then yeah. Be good. How about just to make sure don't listen to michael anymore let's just let's just revoke that privilege <laughs> oh no <laughs> since i'm not allowed to come up with the titles of shows oh. any longer then we just need to remove michael's involvement in uh. telling you so go ahead and you know just uh like Engage. like what we're doing here and uh, tell us how much you love us that's what we want and also remember new shows coming out every marvelous monday morning so you should float to your preferred provider app and just go ahead and subscribe there to make sure you stay with us because it should not be missed but now speaking of things that uh, were not missed my immortal is rearing its ugly head yet again because we are nothing if not one note <laughs> but uh michael had uh, proposed this idea to me that we may return to the well and draw fresh water for once insofar as this variation on my immortal is actually written with a literary bent and everything is not dramatically misspelled and the characters do not comport themselves like drug addled uh, elephants huh? and... I mean, where's the fun in that though <laughs> As speaking for the drug addled elephants uh, <laughs> everywhere, I, I don't know what it is, but we'll find out, I'm sure. But we all learned that the elephants on acid went so well for the elephants. You leave Tesco <laughs> out of this. <laughs> oh, good night, well, sweet Tesco. So what we're offering for you this week and next week, uh, presumably, is going to be Farewell, My Immortal by Maxwell V or Maxwell Le son. <laughs> Maxwell oh, oh, oh. Lafif, uh is, uh, you know, you're the expert here, Michael. That's what it was oh, written. Sure. Okay. Maxwell Smash underscore V. Five. Smash that like button uh, twice. <laughs> and then a third time for good measure, just, just in case. How about you smash that mic button until he stops breathing? Please. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. So. <laughs> Uh, as per usual, as uh, you know, John's uh, typical introduction no longer applies here, and that both Stephen and I have done this in a semi professional capacity at least. So there are a pair of trained thespians amongst us, and then a uh, Michael. <laughs> I'm the missing link. I'm sorry, I'm the weak link. So Either it's, or. <laughs> uh, two, two guys, uh, a girl, and a speech impediment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm both. <laughs> A speech impediment and a girl? Yes, yes I agree. Yes, yes, yes. Well played. <laughs> so, is everyone prepared for our first foray here? As much as I'll ever be. I mean, I don't know if we're ever ready for My Immortal, but sure, let's do it. Indeed. All right. So, we are pleased to bring you Farewell, My Immortal. Chapter One. Ebony had imagined her seventh year at Hogwarts to be a more inwardly focused experience. She dreaded her final year of what had been, for too many days to count, her home. However, in the early morning of the first day of what was already her second month of her last year, Ebony could only think of the distinctive sound of wind against stone. Wind simply sounds like Wind against wood or against metal, but wind has a tendency to whistle against stone, to curve along its smoothly hewn edges like a tune, gently breezing out of a puckered musical mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 
This is very high class, I will tell you that much. <laughs> it was the wind that had waken her, after all. If she allowed herself for too long to lose focus on the low, gentle melodies of the early morning wind against the walls of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, then her thoughts may then turn back to the cruel, mocking wheels of time that were keeping their maddening pace toward a tragic, albeit ceremonious, end to her life thus far, and too many friendships to count. Ebony Way, though she went by her given name, Ebony Darkness, Dementia Ravenway, when attempting to put on airs, was a seventh year at Hogwarts, a fact that she was currently in the middle of distracting herself from. Her eyes flickered open to total darkness. It was not Ebony's to question why she must never wake up to see a friendly face or the early morning sun, and instead is greeted day after day by the unflinching darkness of her coffin's lid. Cursed with vampirism, Ebony only managed to maintain the energy to get through a normal school day's worth of sunbeams and silver. Oh, and silver was to compel her vampirism to rest by sleeping the night away in a satin-lined black coffin. Halfway filled with dirt at its bottom for quasi-magical, quasi-medicinal reasons she couldn't be bothered to understand. Ebony's curse demanded its restitution, however, and she found it on the nightstand beside her now open coffin. One day's worth of blood inside a small glass bottle with a clinical-looking label pasted on it. Her vampirism only decided to eat at Ebony's mind when matters of the heart were already at hand, and such was the case this morning. The pleasant sounds of wind and leaves against the sleeping room's window were not enough to keep her disease from compounding the melancholy that had already rested its full weight on Ebony's heart. Second month already. It's too soon. Time flies far too fast around Hogwarts. It's no use. No amount of self-pitying would stop the river of time from flowing ever steadily towards its destination. Ebony got up and opened her wardrobe. Inside was a packed assortment of gothic clothing, of both a subtly magical and mysterious appearance, and that of the more audacious variety. Though her enemies, of which she had amassed more than one, may have thought her Flashy, revealing, and ill-conforming clothes were a desperate grab at attention. Ebony was finishing a seven-year attempt at breaking out of her shell. Perhaps the moment that even the cruelest jeers would slide off of her vivaciously tattooed skin like water off stone would be the moment she had completed her mission. In that spirit... This day, Ebony had chosen a black corset frilled with black lace around its ends, black combat boots, and a black leather miniskirt. Too much black? Perhaps. <laughs> she adored the way it contrasted against the purple streaks and red tips of her starkly black hair, but she needed more. Variety being the spice of life, pleaded with her to add a splash of color to her outfit. It took only a few moments of glaring into the awaiting mirror before she decided on pink fishnets. Hmm. She had no personal idea as to whether this would, for lack of a better term, work. But her outfit matched some small wellspring of authenticity in her heart that she couldn't avoid. Let them talk, she thought to herself. You'll miss them when you're gone. Bounding down the steps of the Slytherin common room toward the Slytherin porthole, she found herself in higher spirits for having taken the extra minutes to decide on an outfit she liked, even if no one else did, for it had given her the spring in her step she needed. Moving down the corridors toward the dining hall, the inevitable stairs of the, of the preps bounded off her glitzy black leather, and Ebony gave them naught but a half-interested middle finger, used to communicate dismissal rather than contempt. And they'll be, hey. Was someone calling her? She could swear. And they'll be, hey, over here. 
across the corridor in a sea of black robes, Draco Malfoy called to her. Or rather, appeared to, even though he seemed to be getting her name wrong. A normally moody, disdainful, though deceptively intelligent boy. Draco was a pale young man with striking blonde hair and a thin, gaunt, and distinct face. His eyes were a light blue that bordered on grey and gave his whole face a strange, enigmatic look of some hidden knowledge and mystery. Ebony tried to call out to him over the low roar of the corridor, but was drowned out. She settled for an eager wave. The voice of her friends cut through the crowd behind her, and she pried her eyes away from the oddly zealous Draco to meet her compatriots for breakfast. And that is the end of chapter one. And dear gentle Jesus, what a departure from our previous documented attempts at chronicling the foils of young Miss Ebony Darkness Dementia Raven Way. I, I think that was about uh, four times the length as the original first chapter. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> like, I finished like, it in half the time. Paragraphs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if that's... And most of it was about what she wore that day. Indeed. Yep. And uh, was still, you know, very whimsical and joyful, I find. Very true. So, uh, further commentary, friends? I mean, I love that she is apparently putting on airs when she gives her full name. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> of course. I mean, when you use, no one really uses their full name unless they're really trying to sound sophisticated. Mm-hmm. So, or on a dust jacket somewhere, you know. <laughs> also true. true. <laughs> uh, well, let's uh, see how deep the rabbit hole goes, shall we? Yes, let's. All right. On to chapter two. Waking again to total blackness. This complete darkness stung Ebony again this morning. Strange, she thought to herself. Today and yesterday, she'd felt it. Something was starting to touch at Ebony's core, something distant and incomprehensible, but it was present enough to make Ebony yearn. Not yearn necessarily for a view that was only the squeaky opening of a coffin lid away, she could have that in less than two seconds, but a yearning regardless. Somehow it was harder to rise. Certainly wrenching oneself out of a coffin is difficult. Not much arm room anyway, but Ebony was used to that. Her heart sank down toward the bottom of the coffin, pinning her to the soft soil inside like, well, gruesome imagery, though it may be, perhaps a stake through the heart. That seemed to be an apt enough comparison that Ebony made to herself as she whiled away the seconds and minutes before she finally forced herself upward. The outside windowsill was covered in a dirty sleet. The sound of howling winds, more foreboding than yesterday's gentle windy melodies, cut through the air viciously with little regard for the sleeping students. Ebony's hands gently played with the tops of her bottle of daily... Uh, nutrition, when something outside the window caught her eye. Sleet wasn't the right word anymore. It was raining and snowing simultaneously, but appeared to be conjured from different aspects of weather, the harsh, full-bodied snowflakes being caught in the cracking stones of Hogwarts walls, beating against the windows shared the same vast fields as large, bulbous raindrops, unaffected by wind, slamming straight into the roof and on the ground. Two equally stormy but wildly different climates seemed to be fighting for space in the air surrounding Hogwarts. Huh. Ebony noted to herself, trying to shrug off an increasing sense of looming danger. The weight was lifted nearly completely off of her chest when she remembered that she was but a quick shower away from her favorite part of the morning routine, getting dressed. <sighs> No amount of ridicule from the preppier students, who Ebony was certain would prefer to be called upper-class students, could run, the, run, could ruin this for her. 
Having been born of muggle parents and only realizing her magical potential a short seven years ago, it was still amazing to Ebony how the most expressive and invigorating part of her day didn't involve even a single spell. In fact, she had attempted a few times to liven up her look with a Crenus Muto spell to change her hair and was convinced the effect wasn't half as glamorous as she could accomplish on her own with a bottle of muggle hair dye. Besides, she wouldn't want to spare too much noise for magic while the other students slept around her. Ebony drank her bottle of daily sanguine over her oversized My Chemical Romance t-shirt she wore to bed. Blood doesn't stain red, of course. It stains a dirty brown that doesn't look good on anything. She knew that better than anyone. Upon finishing, Ebony changed into a black leather dress over long combat boots and tight fishnets. Realizing she had cheated herself out of precious minutes by working on an elaborate bottom half of her outfit, Ebony threw on whatever t-shirt was still sitting around, a favorite necklace, and put her hair up into an unkempt bun. Hating to leave the dorm room so plainly, she sacrificed an early arrival at class for four pairs of earrings. Ebony, are you still here? The person speaking was a friend of Ebony's named Willow, a girl dressed nearly as ostentatiously as Ebony, sporting waist-length jet black hair with pink streaks and pointed high heel boots over a comparably gothic outfit. What? Ebony responded, having just fastened her last earring. Yeah, uh, be quiet. I'm on my way. Why the hell would I be quiet? Willow responded. You're the last person in here. I just forgot my bag. Wait, is no one else sleeping? Ebony took startled glances around the room to find that all the beds had been cleared out. Oh my fucking god. Ebony upstarted. How late am I? Language, Ebony. Willow's mouth was just as prone to profanity as Ebony's was, but she was right to warn her. Thomas Cranhouten, once a squirrely conniving Slytherin first year who had joined at the same time as Ebony and Willow, had taken to his new job as prefect far too eagerly and was willing to tank Slytherin's house points in the pursuit of making his new role of authority over the other students crystal clear. This included foul language. His weaselly tattletelling had gotten so bad that Snape had to take repeated measures to stem Cranhouten's behavior, lest the Slytherins be embarrassed in front of the other houses. In the time since he'd become prefect, he had gone from Tom, or Thomas, to Cranhouten, even to his closest friends, a change in title slimy Cranhouten himself didn't seem to mind. Right. Sorry, uh, but am I really that late? Ebony gasped. I'm running late to class right now, and I'm fully dressed. Come on! Ebony had no time for makeup, a fact that would bother her until lunchtime without fail. Ebony grabbed her prepared books and ran with Willow out through the Slytherin common room. The hallways were dreadfully empty, lending credence to Willow's urgency. The two began to book it into a half-jog, perhaps even a three-quarters jog, neither of which would be easy on their grandiose shoe choices. So... Willow said between labored breaths, though Willow was one of the sportier, well-built girls on campus, Ebony guessed that she must be wearing a corset underneath her Marilyn Manson t-shirt by her gasps. Saw you talking to Draco yesterday. <laughs> that right? The number of stairs Ebony had to race up was starting to get to her more than she'd admit. Ebony was only slightly less out of breath than Willow. Yeah, oh, whew. yeah, I, I, I was. What about it? Well... Willow said, elongating the word as far as her shortened breath would allow her. Well, what? Willow's silence was prolonged and profoundly annoying. 
Emney didn't have to turn to see the shit-eating smirk plastered all over Willow's face. Well, what, Willow? You like him, don't you? Of course I like him. Who doesn't? Except Potter, obviously. He's a great seeker, tells a good joke, he's popular, won us the house cup at least. Willow's silence continued to pound at Ebony's head. Not in that way. God, Willow, you have to make this difficult, don't you? Ebony waited for Willow to talk so she could tell her to shut her stupid mouth. But it was too late. They had arrived at the hole underneath Professor Trelawney's divination classroom. The two groaned loudly. <sighs> there would be practically no way to avoid causing a scene as they entered the classroom, and truly no way out of Professor Trelawney's insistence that she knew this would happen. Better to pull the bandage off all at once. They climbed up the ladder to the trapdoor of the classroom and opened it with no small amount of noise. Climbing through the door, uh, Willow and Ebony were relieved to find that Trelawney had already assigned each student to their own personal work, so their entrance had not been interrupting a lecture. Oh! Professor Trelawney spoke to the two of them as she looked up from two young Ravenclaw's ink-stained parchment. This term, they were studying advanced heptomology, and they shared this class with the Ravenclaw house. I had expected two late students, though I did not predict they would arrive at the same time. An oversight on my part, but a particularly illustrative one, as the elements of the unveiling future have a tendency not to answer questions that you do not ask. This long-winded nonsense had the unfortunate effect of bringing the class's attention to Ebony and Willow standing in the middle of the classroom. They were so close to having slipped in unnoticed. Had I known that, Miss Way and Miss Tears, I would have simply paired the two of you together. Alas, I was less open, disparate sports with students awaiting a partner. Miss Tears, you will be paired with Miss Patil. Miss Way, you will be paired with Mr. Malfoy. Ebony could feel Willow's awful, beaming smirk on the back of her head. It did little to distract her from the excitement of actually being able to work with Draco, however. The lightness of the clothes on her torso did Ebony more good than she initially realized, as the extra airflow was a gift against the muggy atmosphere of Professor Trelawney's classroom. Hey, Ebony. Hey, Enobe. He got it wrong again. <laughs> Draco truly thinks her name is Enobe Way. After an embarrassing entrance like that, Ebony wasn't about to let the first thing she said to Draco be a correction. Hey, Draco. She could have caught her breath more before going up into the classroom. She was still fighting for air, and now it was warm, stale air she fought for. You okay? Peachy fucking keen. She said, a genuine expression of frustration. Can't remember the last time I spoke so freely. Draco said, leaning on his arm, propped up onto the desk. Not with Cran out and making a mess of things. Well, it's been a weird morning. See anything in the future yet? Draco blushed. Ebony had little idea what about her playful question could have caused such a strong reaction. Well, Draco said, stalling for time as he seemed to be making his mind up about something. Yeah? I definitely see myself going to a good Charlotte concert taking place in Hogsmeade in early November. What? Ebony shouted, not loud enough to get anyone's attention, but loud enough to make Ebony worry she might. 
Let me start that over again, shall I? <laughs> <laughs> Ebony shouted, not loud enough to get anyone's attention, but loud enough to make Ebony worry she might. Gasps were a more frequent occasion as divination classes got more advanced anyway, as students began taking more candid and accurate looks into their futures. Yeah, my dad got them for me, too, and I think I see myself giving one of them away, if... Draco blushed harder. If you know anybody interested. He appeared to have something caught in his eye. Ebony's second exclamation was quite a bit louder than the first, gathered twice as much attention, and lost Slytherin five points. And that is the end of chapter two. And I believe, Michael, if I am not incorrect, that will be where we will end this current installment. That you are. You are correct. Well, a premature cessation is all too often to occur around teenagers, I know. But still, we do what we can. Uh, well, I, I will tell you, just as of right now, I enjoy this uh, about uh, 250 million <laughs> times more than I did my first attempt at My Immortal. Yeah. Because yeah, it yeah. sounds uh, coherent, because there's only so much you can do as a narrator. I also don't sound like someone is sticking me in the hindquarters with a red hot <laughs> poker through 80% of it. And that is a welcome change, I assure you. True. <laughs> Well, Stephen, I am sorry that uh, you know your uh, your efforts uh, were so limited to the the mere handful of lines that you've got, but we're all the better for having you here for them. And Very Michael, true. Very true. you uh, you did you done good. I, I'm here. You, you I, sure, I got a you participation. Sure yes. uh, <laughs> and uh, your your British accent is still perfectly on point. <laughs> I try. Yeah, you sure <laughs> no, do. <I> <laughs> it's a big try. Well, uh, ladies and germaphobes, thank you as always for joining us here on the glorious tubes of you. As per usual, I will extol the virtues of following us on all of the social networks that you are currently not doing so. But, uh, you know, you will find those links scattered throughout our link tree below. It is in the comments. And of course, do all the things to show us you love us. We would certainly appreciate hearing from you but i believe that you can continue to check in with us at uh you know 10 a.m mountain time here on the tubes of you and of course monday mornings we'll be back with new episodes and it's wednesday here on youtube i should clarify but i think for this installment of disinformed fan friction that is going to wrap it up and i am of course kenton el dorado and i am of course Robert Greer, otherwise known as Algernon Greer. And I am, of course, Daniel Duff. So priceless. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. And as always, I want you to remember it's not Leviosa, it's Leviosa.